my, yeah, my friend Jackie loves hogs. Loves yeah. them. Oh, they have a great temperament. She, um, what's the, oh, Tamworth, what was I was going to say, she has Tamworth crossed onto, um, onto the Gloucester and they look an awful lot like these. That's why really? I like to ask, yeah. Apparently, this is the best example of the Oxford Sandian Black. She's a pedigree. Okay, so she's a little bit lighter color, they look more buff. Yeah, she has a very... Like a sandy thick, color. A very thick coat. Even though in horse terms, that one I would pick. Yeah, I mean, because it's... <laughs> liver chestnut yeah yeah <laughs> and a finer coat but um yeah they're brilliant we had six of them previous to these three and, uh, so you just get them and finish them so you just do finishing hogs yeah they finished in about um june so we had them for six months the previous six and we sold them mainly as um pork boxes oh yeah for five kilo pork box the biggest seller was sausages. Oh, People. it always is. People Especially love, with hogs, they, they love sausages. Yeah, and um, we made black pudding as well. We can't sell it at home, I wish we could. Really? I love black pudding, but we can't sell it at home, no. And it was fresh blood black pudding, so yeah. we had a local, um, local place make it for us. So they get fruit and vegetables and they actually eat quite a lot of eggs, so any of our waste, our waste eggs, the pigs eat. Yeah. They're beautiful though. Oh my god, I'd recommend anyone getting pigs. <laughs> Hilarious. It's, you either love pigs or you don't. Like, I will pick small stuff. Really? Yeah. I, I, don't, I, I appreciate and love pigs. Okay, now this field here, you have rotated your hen pens through uh, over the last couple of months. So what we're standing on, when was this grazed by hens? Now this is like, there's a good height of return on the grass here. So when were the hens on this? So, grazing so we pretty much started here uh probably june july and they would have progressed down to the front fence there and then they which move is where the trees are so that tree line where the trees are yeah and then they move every couple of days in kind of a parallel line and turn and come back up the paddock and then turn and go back down so they're running in a parallel line with that fence okay so um Basically, the cattle and sheep started uh, going ahead of the hens, and then the hens uh, followed followed behind them, spreading out manure and um, eating parasites. And eating any parasites, that's right. Um, fly larvae, they eat a lot of fly larvae. Parasitic, also um, worm larvae yeah. and eggs and all those kind of that's things. That's right, and yeah. they keep the fly population down for the cattle then, especially in the winter months. So this paddock, the paddock closest to the road was incredibly uh, overrun with docks and thistles. This is when you first came here? When we first came, yeah. which was four years ago. And um, it, was pretty, uh, it was pretty intense now. The docks were very intense um, population in that front paddock. Now, it was, from what you were saying earlier, it was because it was horse tired. It, was, it had been overgrazed and compacted, which is a sign of what the um, dock is, yeah. is overcompaction. Yeah, so basically the dock was just telling us that um, nothing else could survive in that compaction. And because the docks have such a, um, deep a deep root, they're really just going down to bring the nutrients up and to break through the soil. So rather than looking at that as a... Um, as a weed, I guess it was more of a, a telegram to say things are in trouble. The soil's having a, a under so pressure. So within four years, you've turned this field from dock infestation to uh, what looks like a kind of mixture of grasses. And I see there's other stuff in here. 
Now, you have here some corn coming up. This is, what corn is this? Which grain? So this was oats and it's actually come around because the pigs were um, moving through this paddock as well and the pigs were being fed oats and we were also broadcasting a little bit of oats um, ourselves by hand. You can see a patch here that um, either the hens or the pigs have really got stuck into. So we would simply grab a handful of grain and just throw it onto that and um, it's obviously come up. There's also a little bit of clover coming up there you can see as well. And you haven't, yeah, here's the clover coming up. And you, uh, economically, it was unfeasible for you to sow any seeds. So essentially, your seed bank is rejuvenating, yeah. uh, coming up through, which is the clover. And you were saying, what are some of the other plants you were seeing come through? Because we were talking earlier. Yeah, so I mean, it was quite, um, quite phenomenal that the pasture was really um, predominantly dock and thistles. Um, and then you can see a little bit of buttercup there as well but i mean i guess yeah but that the... that this buttercup that's negligible yeah. i mean that is yeah. that's hardly yeah. any compared yeah. to uh what it was from your description so you yeah. used no poisons no. no no fertilizer no no seed uh you didn't sow any seed no seed you no. literally it was a kind of if you will mob grazing of the chicken the cattle and the sheep rotated through this field how large is this field um this one here is probably about six acres so this is a six acre field that you've basically re regenerated in a holistic management way to be productive in this fashion yeah. and the pigs which i was filming earlier uh, are they a more recent addition to your rotation? We've been running the pigs now for 12 months. So the pigs have pretty much had um, a run through this whole area over 12 months. Um, but it's phenomenal. The seeds that were already in the seed bank were just really waiting for the right conditions to grow. So all we were really doing was accommodating that soil so that they could actually have the right conditions to grow so effectively we didn't do we didn't do anything we just made the conditions right you made the conditions right yeah. now you've done this in four years yeah to the point your profitability you were able to sell this farm and move to a bigger farm yeah that's right and that was on the back of the humble hen yeah 100 percent. the hens are the in. humble hen has <laughs> made you a business now this farm is how many acres this farm is about 19 and a half acres and you have now been able to sell this and you're buying a new farm which is now a house and 35 acres so you have increased you will be able to increase your productive capacity uh and you've done this off the back of the hen yeah with no inputs of fertilizer herbicide plow pesticide pesticide seed seed or anything no i mean and i suppose our inputs are probably very low because the hens are on pasture normally they are eating a huge amount of protein that they gather themselves from the, the, from the insect the yeah. soil yeah. and the grass yeah. and so if you were here for another two years you figure so that would be four five six six years mm -hmm. these fields would become a multi-species sward because of the seed bank because 100%. of what you're seeing now yeah. in... and and the only other thing that's really key to that is the more you do it the more um uh, fertile it becomes so in effect you actually need less and less la land to run the same amount of animals because so you found from your sorry this was 19 acres you have shrunk down yep. to use as a productive value I'd say this year we used about six acres six acres yeah and you're making a very productive income off of that yeah to the point where you're buying a new farm yeah yeah, I mean, it's amazing, but again, it's 100% down to the regenerative nature of the hens and the herbivores that they share this space with. I mean, for us, we only really keep the sheep and the cattle to keep the grass down so that it makes it ideal for the hens to pass over. But when you put all of those together, they're like some phenomenal, magical system. You know, I don't want to sound over the top or flippant when I say that, but the amount of um, 
benefits that they put back into the soil for us. I mean, you can see yourself here, the grass is literally just hopping and up. And here I've got a question for you. What's your off farm job? Yeah, um, that's an interesting one because I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I'm a mum of four children and I began farming here with my husband for, oh, I began farming here four years ago. Um, I'm not afraid to say that we were in debt when we first took over the farm and um, not only am I now full-time employed on the farm but my husband has left his job of 42 years and he's working alongside me here as well. So in other words you are making a viable income for a family of how many? Six of us. Six of you. Both of you are working on this farm, but at the moment you are working off of only six acres. Yeah, pretty much. The income, sorry, is being derived from six acres. Yeah, and I think a lot of that too is about closing the circular bioeconomy, both on our farm and as a family. You know, we grow a lot of our own food. So we eat a lot of eggs, we eat meat from the farm, we grow our own um, vegetables. So our inputs are lower um, by farming like this. We're very, um, we're very aware of the inputs that we bring onto the farm. And those are very, very few. We don't use big machinery. Um, we don't have a huge feed bill because our animals are on grass. And, uh, and we try and minimize as much waste as possible, right down to making candles out of our, oh, our yes. tallow. I know, yeah. <laughs> I love your tallow. She has lovely candles, by the way, made from tallow. And this is her lovely dog who wanted to eat me earlier, but decided I was nice. Yeah, this is Kissy. Kissy? And, uh, oh, Kissy, are you called Kissy? Kissy is head of security. Keeps, keeps away foxes and um, and um, anyone who, who might think about stealing from the honesty box. Oh, good dog, <laughs> Kissy. He's a great dog, aren't you? You're the best boy. Yeah. Yeah, best boy. Who's this? So this is our Marima guard dog. And, um, Where are they originally from? Um, this breed is actually from Italy and um, their main purpose would have been for shepherding um, sheep. So they would assimilate themselves with a flock and then they protect them from any predators. Um, they live out the whole time with their flock and his job is really to keep our hens safe from foxes. Yeah, he, do he doesn't have to contend with wolves or bears. <laughs> No, but I'm pretty sure he'd take them on if he had to. But, uh, so, I mean, yeah. I, and so, has he done any fox damage? Yeah, a fox was um, unlucky enough to get inside there with him and um, he finished the fox off. He was, uh, the fox was lying dead next to the fence the next morning, so yeah. So they, he does his job in yeah. protecting, he, he protects the hens and that's yeah. his job. Yeah, and he's, um, as you can see, he's a beautiful natured dog. But his purpose is very much in... Um, in He's a working in. dog. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I don't think that they... Um, they're not the type of dog that probably would be happy in a backyard or a house. He's very active. And he spends his night sleeping with the hens. So he... Um, yeah, he's... He's lovely and cosy in the hen house. Yeah, and I mean, they have a great fur. They're very um, protected by the weather as well. And it's more very often... Thick. More often than not, you would find him sleeping outside, even though he has a shed to sleep in. He usually works all night, and then he sleeps quite a lot of the day. Good, good dog. Yeah, he's a good boy. Good boy, aren't you? You're a good fella, aren't you? You're a good man. Yeah. Hello, you. Hello. You gorgeous fella. But, um, you know, they're, they're there for a job. Yeah, you definitely wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him, obviously. Good boy. Yeah. Good boy. You're very clever, aren't you? Yeah. Best boy. These. You have sheep. You have sheep. <laughs> yeah, what, are your, what are your sheep? Well, we have a very tiny um, mixed bunch, a very motley crew of sheep. And you probably see with your very um, trained eye, Susanna, that... Um, they don't follow any sort of breed or No, there's a real mix mash in yeah. there. <laughs> so. A definite mix mash of Clin, there's uh, black face yos, there's Suffolk types, there's Cheviot types. Well done, yep. Uh, there's a mountain <laughs> sheep back there, a hill oh, yeah, black faced. Uh, so you've got a huge mi mishmash of um, sheep. We have, so we purchased the sheep originally 
domesticate the grass down um, for the hens. So before the hens come on to a new piece of pasture, we just like it to be um, knocked down and, um, and raised so that it's not too long. So in other words, the sheep are being used as a tool, but yeah. as a tool, they are also uh, proactive in the production for the hens. But then you also are able to sell them as meat boxes. Is that how you do them? Or? Yeah, we actually had uh, we had four lambs to sell as meat boxes this year. Yeah. And uh, we sold those as half a lamb meat box um, processed very locally by a really small butcher. Yeah. Um, interestingly, we also had last year's ram um, that we made a load of merguez sausages and sausage rolls, yum, 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 which yum, were yum. absolutely beautiful. I think we were all a little bit worried about the taint of the meat. No, but you, that's, that's, that's a bit of a myth and a fable. And it, yeah, the yeah. cumin and the garlic definitely. Covers it. Yeah, and yeah. they were unbelievable. So, you can so make delicious tasty. flavored stuff. Yeah. yeah. And that ram actually generated more income than the four lambs did. Well, there you go. Yeah. See, it's yeah. value added production is what yes. you're doing. Um, we also had the hides returned to us and had a go at tanning hides. That's this hard year. work. It was hard work, but you know what? It's therapeutic as well and um, yeah. great for upper arm strength. And yes. <laughs> Who and, needs a gym? Yeah. <laughs> and the reward. I mean, it's actually so beautiful that that mat that we have. Um, you know, it's really lovely. I think it's really respectful to the animal too. No, it's that, using you know, as much of the animal that you've produced on the land. It's yeah. like using the tallow, all these kind of things. I'm yeah. all absolutely for it. It's fantastic that you're doing it. And, and so and well really, here. really apart from that, they're considered a waste product. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, I'm not going to say the hide was perfect or that anyone else would probably want to buy it, but, um, yeah, they're lovely and they're so warm. I mean, yeah. there's a reason yeah. why wool is one of the greatest fibers on the and planet. And by the way, the house in the background is not your house. That's a neighbor. Just yeah. so if anybody watching the video is wondering, wow, she's got a big house. That's not her house. No, that's that's the neighbor. Like lovely neighbors. Yes. Yeah. Lovely neighbors. Yeah. No, no that was excellent job, yeah. excellent job on the sheep. So, and yeah. so the tool is a proactive, productive, and a prosperous tool. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, definitely recommend sheep. I think as you know, fencing is key. Yes. But it's just a um, sheep netting. The sheep netting. You run an electric current through it. Once yeah. the sheep have the idea, they're very respectful of it, and they will be moved onto a new patch of grass every 24 hours. So and it's a 24-hour move. And how many sheep are in this flock here? There's 23 in this flock. So 23, which and I have, uh, I have 24 at home. Okay. So, so you're so moving. We bought them as 16 um, lamb ewes and we bought in a ram and we covered them with that ram uh, last year and then he was the fellow that went off for the sausages and the hide and we kept one of the ram lambs to cover back over the ewes this year so that'll be interesting to see what those lambs turn out to be. Yeah. And he'll be gone for sausages next year. Excellent, and they're a lovely looking, fat, jolly flock. I'm glad to hear you say that. That's a big, <laughs> that's a big recommendation. <laughs> no, well, I, I might have a pedigree flock, but I totally respect uh, the use of half-breeds, hybrids, and different breeds for different production values and things like that. I have yeah. huge respect for that. So that and cool. they're all looking very fat and jolly and happy. They're all, they were all lying down when we were approaching, but we approached as strangers, so they all stood up, which is par for the course as a prey animal is yeah. wont to do. Yeah, and they're very easy to handle. When I'm moving the fence, I actually take the fence down and then I move it and put it up and put the sheep back in there again. So they're a very amenable bunch. Good, that's always what one always wants is amenable yeah. sheep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, our neighbours can vouch for um, when they decide to turn non-amenable, if that's even a word. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Very good. Um, okay, so this is a one of your internal wagons. This is a uh, mobile hen. Um, the hens pop in here. Yeah. The privacy flaps, and they lay their eggs 
Which so this is a privacy flap. And that's the inside. Okay. Oh, and it's banked, so it rolls down. And then the eggs collect here in this um, central area. So you designed this? Yeah, I basically took secondhand equipment from commercial sheds and um, adapted it for us. So let's see if you have any eggs. Oh, look, there's an egg. Egg, nice and clean because nice and clean. it rolled away from the hen before she had a chance to make it dirty. That is such a clever apparatus. So this would have been um, uh, powered by electricity in the commercial shed, but obviously we've adapted it so that it's just able to roll up. So the eggs were collected earlier, so there's just a few. So strays. there's only a few stray eggs. Yeah. Are there any it. more? That no, was that's it. it. Oh well, that um, was perfect for a demonstration. We that have, is excellent. Um, we have these um, which shut the nesting box off. Let so me that, see. So that the hens can't hop in there and sleep and dirty the nesting boxes. Okay, so you close those close. in the. Uh, uh, late afternoon or close evening? Time. Yeah, we close at about three o'clock usually every day so that the hens can hop in there and, um, and So make, how know. do you close this here? So I'm looking, so you're, do you, do you, you pull that apparatus. Just pull it up like then, that. Oh, and a cage, a, a kind of a cage thing goes in. Yeah. Ah. And you can see through the roof, there are solar panels yeah oh, the wow. the building. there's the okay that dark shadow is a solar panel yeah and that powers a uh, battery and during winter we can program um we can program the lights to come on and give them a couple of hours extra daylight we always do it in the morning um because in the evening if the hens if it's dark outside and they come inside they'll still be kind of socializing Whereas they need to go to bed and they need a bit of light to do that. So if you turn the lights off, suddenly they could be in the, the middle of having a conversation, of good gossip, yeah, and exactly. you've interrupted their good it's gossip. Time for bedtime. Yeah. Yeah, it's time for bed, ladies. <laughs> and here they all are in there in the. Um, they're all drinking water. Yes, yeah, so the water comes from the tank outside and just feeds through into those. Um, this hose drinkers. pipe here. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a hose pipe that fills the tank. Of water yeah 100 percent. we have um, water from the mains um, and we just fill up the IBC tank with that no this is fantastic you can see the floor is made out of a 40 mil mesh which allows their manure to drop straight down onto the pasture and fertilize the field it fertilizes the field and we move them every day so that there's no build up there no over fertility on the soil well yeah nitrogen dump yeah exactly <laughs> okay that's fantastic thank you okay, these are the feeders on okay the units. Um, you don't actually have to enter you can fit about uh, 40 kilos in each of these so it's an automatic boxes. feeder that um, it's kind of like a creep feeder that I have for sheep yeah something similar I guess and then when you shut it obviously the feed is prote protected protected by the weather outside. yeah <laughs> Oh, very cross hens inside. This has got a bit more food in it. Yeah, so we feed and collect them around 3 o'clock and shut the nesting boxes at the same time. So a little bit of water is coming in from that. So you might have a do a bit of an overhang next time because yeah. this is an early design. Yeah, this is um, prototype number two. So, well, that's good. Each time you find the problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and improve on it. This is your, egg. what is this? This is our egg grater. And okay. It's been set up like that so that we can clean underneath it. Clean it every time we okay. grate eggs. Okay. Let's take a little reorganization to get it back on. Um, but basically, this is the baby version of egg graters. Good. And the point of it is to grade eggs by weight as opposed to um, size. So the eggs go down this chute. But before they are graded by weight... You have to check that there's no fertility in them? 
We check there's no fertility, but we're also checking to make sure that there are no cracks in them. Oh, of course, no Any, cracks. Any uh, minute cracks, um, deem them to be a class B egg, which means they can be used for cooking, but not for sale. So, you see that one there has a really, really tiny crack? So that one goes to the pigs. Okay. So they roll down there. Lumpies. They're almost mesmerizing. They're really relaxing actually. This job is a favorite one. I was going to say, I used to like the here. In fact, I do them now. So, so oh, these ones like bowling. <laughs> these eggs are medium. These ones are large, extra large. And this one on the other end is um, small. We're having quite a lot of small eggs at the moment. Is that because of the season, do you think? No, it's actually related to the age. I'll say the hens. Oh, the, so the younger hens make the smaller eggs. Yeah, that's right. So what do you do with the dirtier eggs? Do you get to wash them like we do in the States? or? No, we're actually, um, by law, we're not allowed to wash eggs in Ireland. So it's an EU-wide thing. EU eggs are not allowed to be washed in the EU. So we can give them a little rub with a sanding block to take off um, a little bit of dirt, but anything that's really dirty um, usually ends up in a, on our farm going to the pigs or the working dogs have them for dinner or we eat them. Yeah, no, eggs are delicious and great for dogs and um, it's amazing for their coats. Yes. You know, when you feed the eggs to the dogs, um, their coats improve, beautiful shine on them. Yeah. This is so mesmerizing. <laughs> I would do this for therapy. Oh, I think I would too. It is, um, it is, it is very relaxing. It's a lovely job. So how long does it take for your process, your eggs for a day? Like um, how many do you have and then how long does this take to process them? So we would have about four to 500 eggs a day. And it takes me about an, a half an hour to process 20 dozen eggs. So between grading them, packing them, labeling them, dating, date stamping them. Um, oh, that's right, you have to now date stamp everything. Oh, we have to date stamp everything. You have to in the US as so well. So what percentage of them go to like, so you've got the wholesale flats that you are working with there versus So we sell boxes. quite a lot of our eggs through our own um, honesty box at our front gate. Oh, and nice. we also have hospitality customers. So, um, that's a broken one. Um, we have hospitality Sorry. clients. Um, and we have retail. So some people buy direct from the, our website and then we sell into um, other shops and they... Um, so you mail them? We do, yeah. We mail eggs as well. Yeah, we finally cracked the code on how to post them. And, um, so you can buy eggs from you and they can be shipped all over Ireland. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, That's we, fantastic we to know. We have eggs um, heading out regularly to Mayo and to Galway. We have uh, a run to Dublin every week. So we yeah, no, I've seen that on Twitter. You're heading up to Dublin early in the morning. Yeah, we head up once a week and and then anyone who's not in Dublin or a locality of close to Tipperary, we um, we can stick them in the post for people. And they are insulated with wool. Oh, wool yeah. insulated. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So this size and scale, what size flock would you say that this would max out actually? I would say once you got over a couple of thousand birds, this would probably be... So this would be about 2,000 yeah. hens. Okay. Yeah, it's like the baby or the starter version of um, a grader machine. So these go up to uh, machines that can um, process 100,000 eggs an hour. You know, so that's fairly... Yeah, um, we've, most of ours are huge. In yeah, the States, yeah. They have like a massive feeder tray coming in, you know, with... Um, maybe 20 shoots feeding into it so um, it's a lot it's a lot but this is a great machine for us we bought it um, second hand on done deal and um, it's Amazing. worked perfectly ever since yeah it's great gets calibrated once a year just so that the weights are um, correct correct yeah. now I know people are going to ask what are the different colored eggs and who do they represent okay so the brown eggs traditionally come from our little commercial hens and the breed we use here on our farm is Highline, and they would um, 
probably have quite a bit of Rhode Island red genetics in them. Anything that you see that's kind of a little bit unusual, especially one like this, they have derived from a hen who's either been an Aracana or a cream leg bar. And when those hens begin laying their eggs, they're really dark blue, beautiful blue. And as the hen progressively gets older, her eggshell color becomes lighter. And then if you look at something like this, that's come from a hen who is a daughter or a daughter of a daughter of the Aracana or cream leg bars. You can, yeah, you can see a similar kind of tonal texture to it. Yeah, so they, those hens then, the daughters of the uh, Aracana and the cream leg bar, they can lay anything from a gray right through to a really beautiful pink with these lovely speckles on them. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, so that's actually a chicken will lay the speckles. I thought that was like a um, mineral deficiency or something. Oh, yeah, no, they can actually lay that. Uh, and this one here, you can see yeah. beautiful color in that. And some of our um, flock that we hatched this year are starting to lay some really beautiful lavender and gray colors. Oh, which are beautiful. Just gorgeous. They actually look like a, um, a paint palette sometimes when you put them together. They're, they're fabulous. Nice. That's beautiful, I mean, because there's a wonderful variety of colors just in that right there. Yeah, so pretty, aren't they? You like this one right yeah, here. Yes, I like that one. Nice speckled. 